Is it on? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's let's begin. I'm very happy today to uh, introduce our speaker. But before I do that, I'd like to remind you to fill out your evaluation forms before you leave. The mic will be brought to anyone who has questions at the end. So. I'm very happy that we can present to you today Dr. Michi Goto. Dr. Goto comes from um, Japan and had his first me medical school training at uh, Kagoshima University. There he spent time in, um, in a junior residency, then in a senior residency in both internal medicine and neurology, and then be his journey to the United States began about 2000, where he had an internal medicine residency in Lexington, Kentucky at the University of Kentucky, and then at the University of Iowa, where he uh, had an internal medicine residency and graduate education with a Master of Science in clinical investigation as well. Uh, Dr. Goto is um, currently a clinical assistant professor at the University uh, Medical School but spends more of his time at the VA, where he is a, an infectious disease staff physician, and he also is an epidemiologist with the VA Midwest Healthcare Network. So, Dr. Goto has had much experience and uh, much training and is going to tell us about an update on the diagnosis of meningitis and encephalitis. Dr. Goto. All right. Thank you very much for a kind introduction. All right, it's a pleasure to be here. Well, can you hear me okay on the back side? Okay, great, thank you. All right, so my name is Mitch Godo. I'm a uh, clinical assistant professor of the Division of Inf Infectious Diseases at uh, Iowa State, you know, the VA, and the University of Iowa. And uh, you know, the, I you know, mainly do uh, the infection control, but my clinical interest is in uh, neurologic infections. And uh, you know, when uh, you know, we got uh, you know, the request from uh, this medical center to uh, the, our medical school about uh, you know, the CNS infection, you know, the, you know, I was honored to be uh, the, you know, selected as a speaker for this topic. So uh, the, uh, yep, I have nothing to disclose, but uh, you know, the, I spend more time at the VA, so uh, I have to show you this disclaimer as a federal employee and uh, you know, basically just uh, you know, the routine things. So this is today's objectives. So first, uh, I would like to describe the importance of disease recognition and the timely diagnosis of meningitis and encephalitis. And I will particularly you know, the emphasize on the bacterial meningitis, which is by far the most important and the, you know, the most like, uh, you know, demanding you know, the disease among all. And the second, describing uh, the epidemiology of meningitis and encephalitis in US. Then uh, describing the advantages and limitations over new diagnostic modalities for CNS infections. So uh, for the today's outlines, the first, uh, you know, it's always nice to go back to the basics. So uh, I'd like to review some basic concepts in uh, CNS infections. Then uh, try to over, you know, the, provide an overview of updates on uh, epidemiology in adult population for CNS infections, particularly community acquired meningitis and encephalitis. Then uh, you know, discussing about uh, some diagnostic strategies in uh, the CNS infections, emphasizing on uh, you know, newly available molecular diagnostics. So let's start from the case. So uh, Ames is a college town. So uh, let's uh, you know, think about this case. 22 years old, previously healthy college student, was ad admitted to the hospital because of fever, vomiting, and altered mental status. He had uh, some prodromes. You know, around five days earlier, uh, he started having a cough, sore throat, and some rhinorrhea. You know, he thought it, that was just that, you know, the URI and didn't take it too much seriously. You know. None of us do. And uh, on the evening before admission, he developed acute fever up to 39.4 with some just a mild headache. Well, there, yes, mild headache is a very common symptom over viral URI. So again, he didn't take it seriously. However, there, at the noon on the following day, he started having a worse headache and vomiting. And he was taken to an ER by a roommate of the college dome at 6 p.m. 
And upon arrival to EO, that he was lethargic and oriented for only name and place and not for time. So we're starting having some old mental status here. Then 45 minutes after arriving to EO, he suddenly developed grand mouth seizure. And uh, you know, quick examination showed that you know, there, are there are some suggestion for intracranial pressure elevations. Then got emergency CT scans showed that diffuse cerebral edema with herniation. And interestingly, you know, the, upon their first examination right here, there, there was no documentation over neck stiffness. However, you know, this 45 minutes you know, after the arriving to EL, there was apparent neck stiffness, yes. Then you know, around the same time, you know, he started having uh, this scattered the popular you know, the in you know, all extremities. And this is what we call popular fluminance. Then you know, the, you know, he declined really rapidly, was transferred to the ICU. And uh, you know, they developed hypotension, very severe hypotension, which required three maximum pressors. And because of this, you know, the impending, impending you know, the herniation, neurosurgery service was consulted, and the emergency ventriculostomy was placed to manage this ICP. And uh, however, with this you know, the maximized support and the neurosurgical intervention, he passed away at 8 a.m. And autopsy was showing that meningococcal meningoencephalitis. This is a kind of typical the case for meningococcal meningoencephalitis or meningitis. So when we talk about that bacteria meningitis or CNS infections, basically we are talking about that, you know, the possibility of a very severe medical emergency. Potential severity is almost always severe to catastrophic. And there are several unique aspects in the CNS, central nervous systems. The first, the lack of regeneration capability. You know, the, except for neonates, the, our brain doesn't have a capability to regenerate. And you know, the, there is not much you know, the room for the, the rehabilitations. Of course, you know, the, you know, the, some part of the brain can compensate other parts. So that's why you know, the, we really focus on you know, the rehabilitations afterwards. However, almost always the people don't regain full function after having a substantial damage to a brain parenchyma. And also you know, the brain has specific function in each region. So you know, even just a partial insult to the brain can have a potential you know, the global impact on those uh, you know, the functions and the quality of life. And uh, anatomically, you know, the, it is encased in a very tight bony structure, and it doesn't have any room to uh, swell up or release the presser, pressure. So if we have a you know, severe infection, for example, in the skin, muscles, or the intraabdominal organs, and so forth, you know, the, there are some rooms for the swelling. You know, the, yes, the, if we have a you know, severe infection, like abscess on the skin, you know, the, we see a protruding skin, you know, the, which is basically yeah, you know, the diverting of pressure, presser, pressure to outside. And even with the you know, heart or lungs, yes, the, we, whenever we have you know, the pleural effusions or pericardial effusions, we have a decreased functions. But the, before we get the complete collapse of the lung or cardiac tamponade, there are some anatomical compensation mechanism you know, that is it there. And uh, you know, we can uh, you know, there have some time before we lose function, just coming from that pressure increase. However, bony structure surrounding a CNS doesn't have any room to release those pressure. pressure. So uh, there, uh, there, it is very vulnerable to uh, the increased pressure. pressure. And uh, you know, also, uh, we can't visualize or we can see directly what is going on in the brain from the outside. So that's why neurologists aren't always using hammers and uh, you know, the physical examination, neurologic examination, to uh, you know, the make assumption or the, you know, the guess about what is going on inside from our functions. However, the inspection is not uh, the choice for CNS infections. So uh, the all kind of you know, the bacterial or the infectious process which can elevate the intracranial pressure in the skull that can potentially have a very serious impact on the functions and the prognosis, especially bacterial meningitis 
is so fast to progress, and uh, it can quickly elevate those uh, interclinical pressures. So uh, it can potentially have a very serious consequences. Uh, it remains one of the most feared and dangerous infectious disease that any physician can encounter. So uh, when we talk about the CNS infections, there are several classifications here. The first, meningitis, which is basically uh, you know, the infection of the meninges surface of the brain or the spinal cord. Then encephalitis is uh, inflammation over brain parenchyma. And the meningoencephalitis is basically both. The typically, you know, those uh, you know, meningitis and encephalitis are you know, kind of uh, the separated entities. However, in another you know, very severe case of meningitis, it can invade into uh, the encephalitis and can progress into uh, meningoencephalitis. And, and some viral etiologies can infect both of meninges and parenchyma and can cause uh, meningoencephalitis classically West Nile virus. And uh, you know, there are a few other you know, there, you know, there are entities such as brain abscess, subdural or epidural abscess, and the spinal canal abscesses. But I won't uh, discuss about those uh, three bottom uh, entities today. And we'll focus on uh, these top uh, three portions, meningitis and encephalitis particularly. So uh, the before getting into uh, the specific diagnostics, uh, also uh, I would like to give you some refresher for uh, the brain functions and the basic anatomies. The first, blood-brain barrier. This is such an important concept when we talk about the CNS infections or the any kind of CNS disease in general. The, it is actually uh, one of the, you know, the physiologic protective mechanisms you know, the, for our brain. The basically, this is uh, protecting our brain from uh, the, some toxins or the, you know, the chemicals you know, circulating in our body and uh, you know, the keeping our function of the brain. So uh, when we you know, the, you know, have you know, the, you know, the, some alcohol or the, some chemicals or toxins, so that, you know, most of those actually can affect brain function very easily in animal model or direct injection to, into a fecal space. However, because of these uh, blood-brain barriers, concentration of those chemicals you know, that, you know, should, uh, should be kept so low on the you know, CSF and the you know, brain you know, that can be immune from uh, those chemical effects. There, there are three major locations of blood-brain barriers. First, arachnoid epithelium, then the meninges surface, and the choroid plexus. And uh, this is so important because uh, it has a serious the implication for the therapeutics and also diagnostics. So because of this barrier, you know, that we uh, can't know too much about uh, what is going on in the CNS by uh, systemic tests such as blood tests or urine tests and so forth. And uh, you know, the vice versa, you know, the, you know, blood, the content of the blood doesn't go to a CSF too well. But the contents of the CSF doesn't spill out the blood too well either. And also, uh, the, this the, the physiologic protective mechanism can also block very important therapeutic the chemicals, such as antibiotics. So uh, the, we really have to you know, the, you know, select specific antibiotics you know, with good chemical penetration to the brain. In other words, you know, the, the penet the passing of blood-brain barriers. And some medications that can cross blood-brain barrier only in the pr presence of inflammation, such as penicillins, third and fourth generation cephalosporins, or vancomycins. And uh, not all bad lactams are having a good penetrations. For example, the carbapenems you know, that you know, you know, varies, depends on which chemical. The imipenem does not go to a brain, and meropenem relatively does go to a brain well, and erdapenem does not. And uh, you know, first and second generation cephalosporins uh, that absolutely do not go to uh, the brain at all. And uh, among even th among third and fourth generation cephalosporins, the you know, ceftriaxin, cefepim, do go to a brain relatively well. But then uh, ceftazidine, you know, they you know, they're modestly, and uh, you know, they're, they're <coughs> other you know, third generation cephalosporins. We don't have much data. There, how do the bacteria or pathogens get into a CNS space? That typically, you know, that it is a hematogenous spread. In other words, there, you know, there infection elsewhere. Typically, you know, the respiratory tract that you know, they're invades into bloodstream, then go, goes to the brain. And uh, you know, there, there are a few other mechanisms such as contagious, direct to extension from uh, neighboring anatomical sites. That typically sinus or middle ear. And also, uh, in very specific you know, that disease, such as HSV, 
that it can have an ascending infection from peripheral nervous system too. There, however, only relatively few pathogens can survive in bloodstream and can have affinity with the meninges and the brain to cause hematogenous spread to a CNS space. And uh, typically, those are encapsulated organisms that which you know, that basically can trigger slow the killing response among guys uh, from their monocytes or neutrophils or into a cellular pathogens. And the uh, first the example includes the uh, Neisseria meningitis, the uh, unstirped pneumo, pneumococcus, Haemophilus influenzae, or Cryptococcus neoformans. And intercellular organisms that include Listeria, the, and the all kind of virus, particularly enterovirus or arbovirus. So in other words, the immunodeficiencies you know, the, you know, for those opsonization of the encapsulated organisms or the enhanced intercellular organism killing can increase the risk over the CNS infections. And this is a very important concept that when we think about the risk factors and the epidemiology of infect CNS infections. And the last of that, you know, very important concept is what is a typical time cause of neurologic disorders? In general, that we classify neurologic disorders to a focal and a non focal or diffuse. The focal the basically has that of the focal neurologic deficit. And that, you know, that is you know, classical for like a stroke, vascular you know, the complications right here, or traumatic. And basically, this is based, you know, that depending on uh, where we get the ischemia or where we get the insult. The subacute that progresses in days, that this can be you know, vascular, typically venous. However, you know, that can be you know, the abscess, which progresses you know, relatively slowly. And the chronic you know, the, you know, abscess you know, that can progress very slowly as well. And the most of the CNS infection we talk about today are non-focal diseases. And the bacterial meningitis can progress within hours. So this is a very acute process. And the you know, viral meningitis typically progress in the matter of days. And the, you know, the same thing for encephalitis. However, some part of you know, the meningitis, such as fungal or tuberculosis, tuberculosis meningitis can progress over weeks to months. For example, cryptococcal meningitis typically get diagnosed in one month. That's the average time to require you know, to establish a diagnosis. And tuberculosis meningitis, you know, there I have seen a you know, few cases that you know, which has been missed several opportunities over six months. So that's you know, that how it difficult it is to make a diagnosis. So after discussing about these basic concepts, you know, that you know, I would like to go over some disease recognition and the epidemiology of meningitis and encephalitis. First part is uh, community-acquired meningitis. So uh, the classically, you know, we classify community-acquired meningitis to uh, aseptic meningitis and the bacterial meningitis. Of course, there are several different zebras, but you know, that I would say more than 95% of uh, the community-acquired meningitis can fall the you know, class, classification of one of these. The aseptic meningitis is almost a synonym, and that most people use term over aseptic meningitis and the viral meningitis that are interchangeably. The, it the basically consists more than 80% of meningitis cases in community, and typically preceded by uh, you know, the upper respiratory tract infection symptoms or non-specific viral type syndrome for you know, the, a week or two. And the patients are usually appearing relatively benign with no the hemodynamic instability you know, that almost never causes you know, the sepsis picture or the hypotension and so forth. And uh, nearly always, almost always, the alert and oriented unless that this is you know, the they're progressing into uh, meningoencephalitis. And the typical symptoms are the moderate to severe headache and photophobia. This is very common in a viral or aseptic meningitis. And the neck stiffness, this is usually mild to moderate. And the generalized myalgia, this is also very common to that symptom as well. And this is usually self-limited disease. However, you know, when we come to a bacterial meningitis, this is around 10% of all community-acquired meningitis cases. However, often abrupt onset and uh, may or may not have uh, the preceding symptoms just over a few days. So that, you know, that almost never exceeds uh, a week. 
And uh, you know, the progression is very rapid, usually in a matter of hours to a day. And uh, the order of mental status and hemodynamic instability are very common. And it is uh, one of the very most serious causes of sepsis as well. And typical symptoms, severe headache, order of mental status, high fever, and uh, typically uh, moderate to severe neck stiffness unless the patient is uh, immunocompromised. And uh, this is uniformly uh, fatal if untreated. And mortality over the community acquired bacterial meningitis before antibiotic error was uh, you know, over 95%. Now, the, if the patient could survive the meningococcal and meningitis, that case had been reported in the literature. That's how rare it was. So the, we focus on uh, the not to miss bacterial meningitis because if we don't miss bacterial meningitis, so that we have time to figure out the rest. So uh, what are the common symptoms in uh, the bacterial meningitis? The classical triad is uh, fever, neck stiffness, nuclear rigidity, and altered mental status. However, only around one third to a half patient has uh, all of three classic triads. There, however, if you take uh, the two among three, the sensitivity is uh, very good. They almost always have uh, two out of three. And a headache is usually present, the univer universally present in uh, 80 to 95%, unless the patient is having a severe altered mental status and uh, cannot complain about headache. Fever, this is almost universally present and often they're very high, they're typically they're greater than 39 centigrade. The nuclear rigidity, neck stiffness, this is 80 to 90%. And other the mental status is very common too. The 70 to 80 percent, and the you know, GI symptoms such as vomiting, the usually as a complication over increased you know, the ICP, is also a 20 to 50 percent of the time. Etiology of you know, the community acquired meningitis is very broad. You know, the, you know, the we have uh, very broad columns that are left on the virus and the bacteria, and the right side is more like a zebras. And of course, you know, the, you know, we need to focus on common things. And the, these you know, the red you know, the, you know, highlighted things are the usual the, the culprit over community acquired meningitis. Virus wise, enteroviruses, alpha viruses, the herpes viruses, and HIV. These are very the, the important, important etiologies or pathogens over community acquired meningitis. Bacteria wise, in adult population, soap pneumo, meningococcus, H flu, listeria. This is also another important cause. And uh, the mycoplasma, uh, my, mycobacterium tuberculosis, tuberculosis meningitis. When uh, you look at these uh, the organisms, uh, as I said, uh, these are uh, mostly uh, falling into uh, one of these intercellular pathogens, most of these viruses, or listeria, uh, tuberculosis, or encapsulated pathogens, the hemophilus, neisseria, uh, the pneumococcus, or listeria. So in other words, if you see uh, the, a very the unusual cause of uh, the meningitis, such as gram-negative you know, rods, E. coli, the Klebsiella, you know, the Rickettsia, you know, the Streptococcus agalactiae, the, we almost always have to have uh, the, some reasons to have uh, the, you know, these unusual organisms. And the gram-negative meningitis, community acquired gram-negative meningitis, almost never you know, encounter you know, in the practice in Iowa. However, the, the, when I did the, the, the internal medicine residency the, the, in Kentucky and also the neurology residency in southern Japan, the, I've seen the, the, several cases, the, 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 almost nearly 10 cases of community acquired gram negative meningitis because of higher incidence rates over HDLV1 and the stone geroidiasis. The, however, the, the, if the, we don't see any of those, the, such as in the Midwest, we almost never see a community acquired gram negative meningitis. So uh, the, to have those unusual organisms, we almost always have, uh, have to have some kind of reason to explain it. Epidemiology of community acquired meningitis has changed greatly over years, especially among bacteria meningitis. And uh, no, this is partly because of aging society and the increasing number of population with risk factors such as immunocompromised host. However, no, this is also uh, largely no, no, thanking to uh, vaccinations. And uh, we started hemophilus influenza type B vaccination in uh, 1998. 
and the quadrivalent, the meningococcus the vaccine, and the pneumococcus vaccine, and the MMR vaccine, and so forth. And those the vaccination you know, that has changed the epidemiology of community acquired back meningitis greatly. And also, right, we have seen several new other pathogens, such as West Nile virus. So for example, that this is you know, the etiology of bacterial meningitis in the US in the last three decades. In the 1970s to 1980s, the new meningococcus was, the, I'm sorry, the, the hemophilus influenza was by far the most important the pathogen over the meningitis, however, followed by uh, meningococcus. And the pneumococcus the, was actually relatively minor etiology over the bacterial meningitis. The, however, the, once that we introduced the, the hemophilus influenza type B vaccination among kids the, in 1990s, the, it greatly decreased the, the prevalence over the H flu meningitis. And then, uh, also, uh, we in introduced uh, you know, the quadrivalent uh, you know, meningococcus vaccine, vaccines in uh, the 2000, which also uh, almost declined the incident to half. The, for the meantime, the, the relative proportion over pneumococcus has greatly increased over time. And now we are uh, increasing uh, the vaccination against pneumococcus particularly the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. So it will be very important and interesting to see you know, what will happen with the, this pneumococcus, you know, the, the meningococcus you know, the, the, the epidemiology in the next uh, two, uh, one or two decades. And the listeria you know, has not changed over time too much. So uh, this is uh, the kind of version of the very important and the textbook of the you know, risk factors for the bacterial meningitis based on age and important risk factors. The, I'm not a pediatrician, so I'm not qualified to talk too much about uh, these pediatric populations. However, the, in a general, relatively younger populations, the strep pneumo and the meningococcus are by far the most important pathogens over bacterial meningitis. Once we pass the age of 50, we start seeing uh, some uh, cases of listeria. And listeria is very you know, interesting organisms which can cause uh, meningitis, encephalitis, or meningoencephalitis. Then uh, the, when we see an uh, immunosuppressed the patient, particularly the cellular immunodeficiency, the, we also see uh, the listeria and some gram-negative you know, rot meningitis you know, the, if we see, you know, the, see you know, practice in cell. And the basal skull fracture, this is almost always the strep pneumo. And the neurosurgical procedure is very, very different than animals. And the, the, you know, this is the, the usually caused by staph aureus or aerobic gram negative rot, including pseudomonas. And the, you know, the, when we talk about the risk factors other than age, you know, the, for bacterial meningitis, that typically we see a humoral immunodeficiency, you know, the, you know, such as A gamma globulinemia or complement deficiencies, or A splenia. Those patients basically have you know, a decreased capability to clear encapsulated organisms from bloodstreams. And you know, the neurosurgery or head trauma, viral, which has a strong seasonality, and the more than 80% of the viral meningitis happens in summer. So uh, the, if we see a viral meningitis in the winter, there is something of that funny going on. And the sexual history is very important that, to think about HIV. And in my opinion, everybody with CNS infection deserves HIV testing. And the uh, outdoor exposures and the troubles, you know, that, which is very important for you know, the West Nile virus or the, some other alvovirus you know, infections. Fungal, this is usually you know, that caused by uh, cellular immunodeficiency or the, nowadays, we see more and more the TNF alpha the blocking therapy the agents for rheumatologic diseases. So those can elevate the risk over fungal disease or tuberculosis disease. And tuberculosis, you know, if we see a very slowly progressing meningitis, this is almost always the you know, differential diagnosis. And the tuberculosis meningitis is one of the most difficult disease in uh, infectious disease practice in general. And uh, you know, the, you know, in US, immigration from high prevalence countries and incarcerations are two most important risk factors for TB. And uh, you know, outdoor exposures increase uh, you know, the risk factor for the risk for rickettsia or Lyme disease. And uh, you know, the, compared to meningitis, when we talk about encephalitis, the, 
Yes, by definition, it has to have a brain parenchymal involvement. So we're at focal neurotic sign, focal neurotic sign. This basically distinguishes you know, the, you know, the encephalitis from meningitis. And uh, you know, the, it may present as a character or personality change, especially on temporal or frontal lobe you know, the presentation. And all the mental status you know, that can be coming from a basal ganglia you know, the, uh, involvement, but typically, you know, they're seeing in allovirus infections, you know, which impedes the you know, ascending reticular you know, the activation system you know, arising from you know, the thermos. And the meningeal irritation is usually less common than meningitis. And also there are other clues, including you know, outdoor exposures, animal exposures, and travel history, and so forth, are very important the clues where we you know, the, you know, make diagnosis of encephalitis. However, the making you know, the, you know, microbiologic diagnosis of encephalitis is very challenging. And typically, it is caused by a virus or autoimmune process, if we know what it is. However, around 80% of all encephalitis cases remain idiopathic. And the state of California and the Department of Public Health at the California have, that had, have done a so-called California Encephalitis Project you know, for the last two decades. And they are collecting you know, the, you know, every single case of encephalitis in the state of California and are doing uh, extensive research based on testing for the, all specimens. However, with that you know, the, you know, exhaustive and research-based investigation, they could have identified only around 60 percent, I'm sorry, 40 percent of etiologies. So in real clinical practice, uh, it's fair to say around 80 percent of all encephalitis cases remain undiagnosed. And presumably, you know, there are uh, many autoimmune pathogens, uh, autoimmune etiologies uh, among those encephalitis, but we just simply don't know. This is how we discovered the, you know, multiple autoimmune pathogens, autoimmune the, you know, the, the antibodies against encephalitis, such as anti-NMD antibodies or the anti-potassium-gated, anti-voltage-gated potassium channel antibodies, and so forth. And uh, you know, the, again, this is a kind of diagnostic clue. And uh, if we see a, a specific anatomical site of the infection, such as on the temporal lobe of herpes encephalitis or basal ganglia of other virus infections, that can be a very strong clue. And as I said, that, you know, that typically it has a strong seasonality, just as uh, viral and meningitis. So uh, the classically, many, the, the West Nile virus or other virus infection happen in summer. And uh, if we see a winter or spring, that is usually uh, the mumps or the measles. And uh, you know, the HSV or HIV that can happen any, at any season. And uh, there are several you know, the important the pathogens with the geographic distribution, such as yellow fever or Japanese encephalitis. So uh, the, if you have uh, some travel history to endemic regions, we may have to think about those and zebras as well. And uh, the, when we uh, think about encephalitis, uh, the practically uh, the only thing we can do and we should do is making sure there is no treatable uh, the cause, which is HSV encephalitis. Typically, uh, the, it involves temporal lobe, uh, the, as, I, <coughs> as you can see on this uh, MRI. And the uh, classical presentation is a fever and a personality change. And uh, the, these are almost uniformly uh, present in uh, most of the cases. And seizure is very common. And because of that, uh, the temporal lobe involvement, and if it happens on the left side, aphasia is also a very common uh, symptoms. And uh, no, there, we no, there had a thought CSF HSV PCL have a very high sensitivity and specificity. Now that we are having uh, some doubt on this uh, that, no, sensitivity, no, that, no, as we learn more about that, no, the atypical presentation of HSV, and uh, no, that now the experts are saying that, that we can have a negative result in the very early phase of the disease. So if you suspect HSV you know, encephalitis and the initial test was negative for HSV PCL, it may be reasonable to repeat it you know, in uh, two to three days while continuing uh, acyclovir. So these are kind of like a you know, quick overview of the etiologies and the epidemiology of the meningitis and the encephalitis. So when we there, you know, there talk about uh, those epidemiologies, then uh, the next step would be uh, how we should make a diagnosis of those then. The general principle over the diagnostic approach for sinus infection is basically the same as any other infectious disease, but particularly true 
so that we have to make a balance between these uh, two com uh, conflicting priorities. Accurate diagnosis and effective use of resources and timely management and the consequence of mismanagement. There, I'm repeating this statement multiple times over this talk you know, because this is by far the most important concept. Whenever we see a CNN infection, we always have to ask ourselves, am I missing bacterial meningitis? This is by far the most important concept because the time is money. There are many studies that indicated that the delay of antibiotic therapy you know, that, you know, leads to a higher mortality. And uh, you know, this is the one study that you know, published in you know, the early 2000s. And you know, they looked at you know, the you know, door to antibiotic time you know, the, and their outcome was mortality. And uh, if we started the you know, therapy you know, the within five hours, the mortality you know, had not you know, changed too much. However, this is just for the chance of death. And uh, if you think about the, the functional recovery and the morbidity, the, there are some data showing uh, you know, that 30 minutes over you know, the 30 to 45 minutes over door to antibiotic time is a kind of watershed moment. And uh, you know, that it is going to be critical whether we can start antibiotics within that time frame to uh, facilitate the full recovery of the nervous system. So we're always, always try to uh, suspect bacterial meningitis by having a low threshold and uh, you know, try to initiate antibiotic therapy ASAP while trying to uh, continue the efforts to make that accurate diagnosis. We talk about that, uh, we are talking about you know, weeks of antibiotic therapy and uh, you know, with typically very high dose. So it's not a benign thing to do you know, there and uh, you know, we always have to pay a you know, great effort to establish diagnosis but also at the same time Time is money. So uh, the, in terms of physical examination, there, there are a few uh, important uh, topics. The first, there do not miss meningeal irritation signs. The most important thing is the, you know, the neck stiffness, the nuclear rigidity. This has a moderate sensitivity and moderate specificity. And this can be negative in the very early phase of the disease you know, that, you know, that I described in the you know, first case presentations. There, I've had that you know, the case that you know, there, I did not see uh, any neck stiffness. You know, that at the time I saw the patient you know, that, you know, right after the, you know, the ER arrival, and uh, two hours later you know, that, you know, there was uh, some neck stiffness. That can happen and progress over time in the matter of you know, minutes to hours. And also right, that do not miss intracranial hypertension sign. And uh, you know, there, these days, uh, you know, very few people are doing uh, fundoscopic examination, but this is a uh, you know, very quick and very accurate evaluation of intracranial pressure. And uh, you know, the, you know, the, if you are a pediatrician, uh, you may want to check uh, the anterior fontanelle, the, you know, making sure there is no bulging. And uh, you know, the do not miss focal neurologic sign. That basically distinguishes between meningitis and encephalitis. And uh, you know, the, this is uh, just a you know, visual presentation of papillary edema. The, this is a normal fundus with a sharp you know, demarcated border of the disc. And here, that, you know, the border of the disc is uh, getting blurred. So uh, lumbar puncture is always very important because, as I said, the, we can't the, make too much the, from bloodstream unless the, you are very lucky and the, you know, can catch pathogens by uh, blood culture. So uh, the lumbar puncture and the CSF sampling is uh, you know, the single most important diagnostic test for meningitis and a very important test for encephalitis too. And uh, I would say must do test for uh, the any CSF infections, CNS infections. And of course, there are a few contraindications such as intracranial mass lesion or intracranial hypertension and a severe thrombocytopenia or coagulopathy or agitations. And uh, when we get that uh, CSF uh, samples, that we typically uh, test the opening pressure, the cell count with the differential, glucose, photoprotein, gram stain, and bacterial culture as routine things. And uh, you know, the, I would say you know, the, you know, the cryptococcal antigen and the, you know, the, some basic molecular diagnostics such as ACSP, you know, the PCO, you know, can be included to a routine testing too. And the AFP you know, smear and culture, the fungal smear and culture, you know, the 
Now, as well as cytology, you know, that can be an optional depending on you know, the clinical context. But I would say that you know, having a very you know, the low threshold for those additional testing would be recommended. And typically, you know, we see uh, that 1,000 to 5,000 uh, cells over uh, the bacterial meningitis there you know, in CSF. There, and you know, the primary cell in a bacterial meningitis is typically neutrophil, and glucose is very low by consumption of glucose by uh, neutrophils or the bacteria. And the protein is usually you know, that very high, somewhere between uh, 100 to uh, 500. And viral meningitis is typically lymphocytic you know, meningitis, and uh, almost never exceeds you know, 500. And I included up to 1,000, but uh, almost we never see uh, the 1,000 cell count in a viral meningitis. And tuberculous meningitis is very uh, tough to diagnose. Usually, CSF change is uh, very modest, and uh, you know, the glucose can be uh, low. But uh, that, you know, typically, you know, the you know, glucose you know, the lowering is very modest. And the fungal is uh, very similar to uh, the tuberculosis. There are a few exceptions, such as a very early phase over the meningitis. Any meningitis can be normal. And the listeria is the only exception among all bacteria, and which can have a mononuclear dominant the, the CSF. And very early you know, viral and tuberculosis meningitis can have a neutrophil dominant the CSF. So uh, the, if the clinical context and the presentation doesn't make sense for neutrophilic the, the presentation of bacterial meningitis, it is recommended to repeat CSF examination the 48 to 72 hours later. This is a typical CSF appearance of the meningitis. The, typically, the, you know, CSF should be uh, very clear with no color and uh, completely translucent. However, the bacterial meningitis are typically you know, yellowish and very cloudy. And uh, on the gram stain, uh, most of the uh, bacterial meningitis uh, you know, gram stain are not modest unless that patient had received antibiotics for more than uh, six to eight hours. There, how about imaging studies? Because when we talk about CNS, uh, you know, most people uh, almost automatically go to uh, imaging studies, such as CT or MRI. And uh, I would say for the meningitis practice, the, the only useful the diagnostic the imaging is CT scan, just to rule out the, com the contraindication for LP. And it's a very good, quick evaluation over intracranial process, and that can the, eliminate most of the contraindication for the, C the CSF sampling. And uh, you know, the, however, the, it almost can never visualize any change on the, the meningitis. And uh, on the other hand, MRI can be a useful test for encephalitis. However, uh, almost uh, you know, they never become useful for meningitis practice. That if you get the, the contrast MRI, it may or may not show con some contrast enhancement on the meninges, but sensitivity is around 50%. And uh, it's not the greatest test in the world. And uh, the, you know, I would say generally not necessary the, you know, for the evaluation of acute meningitis. And uh, you know, we shouldn't waste time to get the MRI the, before the, the studying antibiotics. The, one of the commonly asked questions is when to obtain CT scan before LP. And uh, you know, the indication is basically possible intracranial mass or a possible elevated the, the ICP, the intracranial pressure. So were uh, there any focal neurologic sign presence, any known intracranial pathology in the history, or immunocompromised host, such as you know, the HIV or cancer chemotherapy patients, and so forth, should get uh, you know, the CT scan uh, because of uh, the possibility of a brain abscess or toxoplasma, that kind of uh, the, you know, the mass affect the lesions. And a possible elevated ICP, you know, such as presence of papillary edema, or both, which usually you know, that refers to auto mental status, that, that deserves CT scan before LP. However, this can be done emergently, and that, you know, we should not wait that until formal reading of the radiologist. Just a quick glance of the image, you know, that making sure there is enough space on that you know, basal cistern, and then the absence of you know, the obvious. You know, the, no, mass lesion, which does not require any trained eye, should be more than enough to rule out LP procedures. 
This is a kind of like a suggested sequence of event in EL when we see uh, that community acquired many judges. So our first, uh, that, you know, the prompt the recognition of the disease is very important. Then a uh, rapid physical examination. And I would say that you know, blood culture is uh, that, you know, uh, very valuable here. Then uh, the needs LP before, uh, needs CT before LP, yes or no. And uh, the, oh, the, I'm sorry, the, there is a typo here. It should be that, you know, vice versa. You know, this should be no and yes here. And if the patient you know, that, you know, does not require the CT scan before LP, do a bedside LP you know, that, you know, that just one attempt. And uh, you know, that if you get the, you know, the CSF, that's great. And then you know, that start therapy you know, according to Gramsci results. Or the, if you couldn't get you know, that CSF sampling, you know, you know, start empiric antibiotics ASAP. Then you know, get the CT scan and uh, get the LP you know, that, you know, that by you or the trained that, you know, specialist, such as you know, the intervention radiologist. Then gonna you know, perform the LP to modify therapy if needed. Again, goal for door to antibiotic time should be uh, less than 30 minutes. And the sense of urgency should be as you know, that, you know, serious as AMI, acute myocardial infarction. And of course, you know, that there are some situations that we have to say, I couldn't get LP done in EL. You know, that, yes, some presence of contraindication or a technical difficulty. In those cases, that, you know, that we may have to call neurosurgeons or interventional radiologists. However, again, you know, that, you know, MPIC therapy you know, that should be continued while waiting for CSF sampling. Yes. It is true that antibiotics administration can decrease the sensitivity over CSF cultures, and that, you know, especially too for meningococcus. And meningococcus is such a you know, susceptible organism, and typically you know, can die within uh, the, you know, the half an hour after administration of antibiotics. There, however, the CSF analysis findings you know, remain similar for the two to three days, so we still can make uh, that, you know, the, some sense about this is bacteria or not. And also, uh, the, you know, we can obtain blood cultures uh, that, you know, which has 30 to 40 percent sensitivity for bacterial meningitis pathogen detection. So uh, the, we can have some backups. These days, you know, the, there are more you know, the, and more the interest in uh, developing uh, molecular diagnostics, uh, particularly you know, the multiplex PCL testing for CNS testing. Basically, the idea is uh, taking that CSF and testing everything by uh, genes. The DNAs or RNAs, and then uh, if we can catch those pathogens, uh, we get the answer within hours. That's basically the idea. And uh, there are several uh, the, you know, the <coughs> commercial products uh, coming up or already available in the market. And uh, you know, I listed the three as uh, examples. And as of now, only film array or the biofire diagnostic has uh, the FDA approval. And there is the two more, the, uh, I'm sorry, one more the, you know, the diagnostics with FDA approval pending. And uh, you know, some institutions using uh, the, you know, the multiplex PCL paneling for blood diagnostics for the CSF as off-label use. And theoretically, you know, that it can detect pathogens that, you know, even after antibiotics administrations you know, by detecting a DNA, not the live organisms, but you know, that, you know, they're, it's very you know, that, you know, they're questionable. And uh, there are some the labs or academic medical centers using an in-house developed validated test at the reference of Lovely, such as Mayo or the Arabs. And uh, uh, we use that on some in-house validated uh, uh, diagnostics at the University of Iowa as well. And uh, you know, the, what those uh, the, you know, the PCL kit typically include are like this. You know, the bacteria, you know, typically it includes five or six bacterial pathogens, such as pneumococcus, meningococcus, H flu, listeria, and group B and E. coli for the neonates and the pediatric meningitis. The, usually, it does not include the club pneumo or alvovirus, West Nile virus, and the tuberculosis and so forth. And the virus wise, the, it may include the, you know, the HSV1, HSV2, CMV, VZV, and the, you know, the, you know, the, some kit includes the EVV or the HS, HSV7 you know, as well. And the, some kit may or may not include cryptococcal neoformans or GATI. And most importantly, Turnaround time is very fast, typically less than two hours. So uh, there are many people initially thought that could be a game changer for the CNS and the 
particularly the bacteria meningitis practice and diagnostics. And uh, so the, we just saw uh, the one published validation study over the, this multiplex PCL kit, the, specifically the BioFire, the last year on uh, JCM. And uh, they enrolled the, almost 1,600 CSF specimens from 11 referral medical centers in US. And uh, you know, they concluded that you know, the sen sensitivity was 94%, uh, specificity was 97%, so that if we use culture-based method as a reference standard. And uh, you know, just to be fair, these are very impressive numbers for most diagnostics. The problem is that, you know, that you know, the bacterial meningitis is relatively a rare disease. And as you can see, the around five or six percent of the specimens, only five or six percent of the specimens were positive. So even with this and a very impressive the sensitivity and specificity, positive predictive value still can be only 60 to 70 percent, while the negative predictive value remains fairly good. So the positive result needs to be interpreted in the clinical context. That's a very challenging thing about this molecular diagnostics. And uh, they also uh, they, you know, calculated the different numbers using uh, you know, the several more the additional the molecular diagnostics or the antigen testing in addition to culture-based method to increase uh, the yield over the, the CSF testing. And uh, that increased uh, the positive predicted value to around 80%, but still, they're, they're, it's not completely reliable. So uh, the I would say you know, that this you know, that needs to be you know, that, you know, that used with caution. And that, you know, that, you know, there are some situations that the early closure of the diagnosis or the you know, diagnostic effort can lead to mismanagement by having you know, false positive or multiplex PCL. And there was one very in uh, interesting case report that came up on that open form of infectious diseases at the end of last year. And basically, you know, they, they you know, had the HSV-1 the positive you know, the result on the CSF on you know, the relatively acute encephalitis patient. And then you know, they you know, got the, you know, the molecular diagnostics, multiplex PCL, and they thought that was the HSV PCL, and then you know, the case was closed, continued a cycle year, and stopped everything else. But it turned out that it was indeed tuberculosis, the meningitis. So where the, we really have to interpret those results in the context of you know, the clinical the presentations. So uh, the, I would say you know, it should not be considered as replacement over you know, CSF culture. So uh, where you know, this newer the molecular diagnosis can fit in the clinical practice? The, I would say that it can be a useful test at facilities without 24-7 microbiology specimen handling capability. The, some of the CSF pathogens particularly meningococcus, can die they, by just by a simple refrigeration and don't survive in the test tubes. So uh, it needs to be as processed as soon as possible. So uh, if you don't have a uh, 24-7 availability of trained microbiologic technicians, this may be uh, the reasonable second option. The, however, uh, the, if you have a uh, 24-7 uh, no, working uh, microbiologic lab, the value of this uh, multiplex B cell may be limited. And uh, the also, uh, the I would say uh, that this needs to be uh, uh, interpreted in appropriate clinical judgment, and uh, still, where it fits the clinical practice, jury is still out. We are still trying to figure out where is the best uh, utility of this uh, method. So this is my last slide for, the, uh, slide for the today. And uh, you know, take home points. When a CNS infection is suspected, acute evaluation should aim to exclude bacteria meningitis. That is by far the most important topic. And the microbiology is highly valuable to treat the you know, patient appropriately. And the successful vaccination has changed epidemiology significantly over time. And the pneumococcus is by far the most important pathogen of the bacterial meningitis in US nowadays. And the constant patient with the risk factors and patient risk factors and the environmental factors such as season or travels when we think about, about differential diagnosis of CNS infections. And the newer molecular diagnostics are promising, but should be used with caution. Well, the, this is the last slide for today. And uh, you know, thank you very much for listening. And uh, I'll be happy to take any question. Thank you very much. <laughs>
on the uh, physical examination, uh, the jerk accentuation, uh, how's that done? Yep, so well, jolt accentuation is basically uh, simply you know, the shaking the head of the patient. And uh, initially, that was described by you know, that Dr. Jolt in 1960s, I believe. And the idea is uh, that you know, having you know, that, you know, that, you know, that meningeal irritation, so that, you know, they, you know, that, you know, that tends to have an increased headache by you know, motions. So we're just simply uh, you know, that shaking the head of the patient that in the horizontal directions. And that, you know, that, you know, if the patient complains that, you know, that increasing the headache, that's a jolt accentuation positive. Sensitivity is impressively high, almost uh, you know, close to 100%. The problem is uh, you know, that, as you can imagine, specificity is very low. And uh, there was one study that, you know, that published, I believe, that a couple years ago, that validating the utility of the jolt accentuation. And uh, you know, the specificity was around 30 to 40 percent. So. How often? Thank you. How often do you, you you don't really defer doing the LP, do you? Because of of of, uh, of the of the suspicion of increased pressure. Yep. I mean, isn't it, you got to do the LP, right? Exactly. So with the presence of papillary edema, that basically that you know, means a possible inter increase of intracranial pressure and the impeding herniations. So you know, that, you know, once you know, that we can eliminate the possibility of impeding that you know, herniation. Yes, we still can do LP. So the you know, presence of a papillary edema basically means that patient needs CT scan before LP, but you know, that it does not you know, contraindicate the LP itself. No. Very important question. Thank you. Sure. So uh, the therapeutics is also another you know, very big topic for the meningitis and back of the encephalitis. So uh, I did not know that, you know, that get into a therapeutics today just because of the time constraints. And uh, typically the recommended you know, that empiric back antibiotic therapy for the adults without the specific you know, that, you know, contraindication under age of 50, uh, under the specific risk factor under age of 50 is combination of vancomycin and the ceftriaxone. And over age of 50, or that any kind of presence of cellular immunodeficiency, that we add high dose ampicillin to a vancomycin and a ceftriaxone. And that, you know, that if you have any the you know, risk factor for the gram negative meningitis of that possibilities, we typically recommend that you know, replacing that the ceftriaxone by a cefepime. Anything else? Thank you very much.